And uh, there's someone else I want to recognize uh, from uh, the podium this morning. I want to recognize the, and thank uh, Joe Cedia for his efforts in keeping uh, our walkways safe uh, in this Siberian moment. When you cross uh, on 3637, when you cross uh, the uh, reservoir there and you look left, it looks like something out of the Targa, you know, in frozen wasteland. When it gets to uh, zero, we have to, uh, we have a small dog, we have to put musha paste on her paws because uh, the uh, pads will freeze on the, on the, uh, gr- on the ground. Well, it's time for us uh, now. It's uh, that time uh, of the week for that we take a look at the Word of God and consider what it's telling us. The Word of God is wonderful. It, it is a, a vital connection that we have with our Creator and our Savior God. And uh, it performs all sorts of functions, one of which is uh, it is a mirror and not uh, always a very complimentary mirror when we peer into it and if we're prepared to hold the vision and look intently we will find that we need to make some changes in our appearance and that is the function that it has. We're in Luke uh, chapter 18 And uh, we are in the second of the parables in that uh, chapter on at verse nine. And in both these instances, both both parables, Luke has given us a comment on them, which would which would authorize us to consider the parable in this way. And he said in verse 9, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. He told these people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. And we'll see that uh, we have two very different characters here in this parable. So keep in mind that this has been aimed at people who consider themselves to be righteous. And as a consequence, whether it be an automatic consequence, well, actually, it's an automatic consequence of somebody who thinks they're righteous and are not righteous, that they would be contemptible of other people, but that they would treat others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And just uh, as an aside, I, I love listening to that prayer of Solomon because it's a king talking to his mighty God. He describes himself as a servant. And you can see the spirit of work in him because it's also accurate. And he actually prophesies these things that are happening, that are going to happen. So he's prophesying as he's praying. And uh, he's uh, supplicating and he's, he's humble. And he doesn't take on anything that he doesn't uh, deserve. And he thinks into the future. Now this is the, the temple that these two men are coming to. Of course, they're not Solomon's temple. They're, they're, that was destroyed. But nevertheless, it's the temple that the Lord wanted built. And it was built by Zerubbabel. And uh, then expanded by Herod but it nevertheless is the temple. And these two are very different men. They're, the Pharisee is a man who has committed his life ostensibly to the law, the keeping of the law, to the, to the uh, practice of righteousness, 
and obedience, which uh, we'll find doesn't work. And uh, he is part of a system, and he is part of uh, a, an economic process. He likely makes his living, whatever that might be, f- through this position that he has. It's, it's quite hard to get a hold of the history of the Pharisees uh, through the writings. It's, we know where they ended up, which is here. Uh, and for the most part on the wrong side. But uh, how they grew up in that intertestamental period is complicated. Nevertheless, we'll take it at face value that here he is, part of this system. And uh, the tax collector, he's the guy who is at the very opposite in that society. He is considered by most people the scum of the earth. Not only uh, does he collect the taxes, not only is he a robber of sorts, but he's also also working for the oppressors. He's uh, not a patriot. He's working for the Romans or for uh, the the kings there who aren't... uh, Israelites either. And so he's a traitor. He's a swindler and he's a traitor. And it's easy not to like this guy. It's really easy not to like him. Imagine, if you will, somebody who is being paid a lot of money to influence our government uh, in favor of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, you know? We went from the CCCP to the CCP. And I don't want to dwell there because, but imagine somebody who is paid a very great deal of money to make trouble for us and to not care about us. And of course the business here was that he would be given a quota to meet And how he meets that quota is up to him. And so that brings in all sorts of evils, as you can imagine. There'll be people he'll leave alone, you know, because they're... And of course, they always want somebody who is in that society. They're they're not going to put a Roman in there. They're going to take a, a Jew and make him a traitor to his people because he knows where the money is. He knows where, how to operate this thing. And when he makes more than he needs to, then he keeps it. And that's the way it works. Rome doesn't care as long as they get their money. There was a case here where a veterans organization contracted with a company to raise something like $2 million for an event, for a a memorial of some sort that they wanted. And what happened was $8 million was raised And there was a court case about this because the company that had been contracted to do it was keeping the other six. And I've got bad news for you. They won the case. So things haven't changed. So we've got this guy, this tax collector, who is easy to hate. And this Pharisee, who's apparently the paragon of virtue. Right away, we see trouble. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortionists, unjust, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. So when he starts to address the Lord and says, I thank you, we can be in hope that what will happen is that he is going to lay out his gratitude to the Lord for everything that he's done for him. But that's not the case. He's piqued by the fact that this man is in there with him, standing away from him. 
and he decides to express to God his superiority to this other man, which gives us an immediate view of his problems. So, if you look through the various translations, it's extortionists, swindlers, and thieves. People describe the the uh, profession of tax collecting in that way. And so uh, we have to look uh, first at um, Luke uh, 16, chapter 14, uh, verse 14. And it says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and ridiculed him. Now, of course, he is, we're referring to, uh, to the Lord's uh, assertions, but it describes them as lovers of money. And then if we go to uh, John chapter 2, it's very familiar territory here, but uh, in John chapter 2, this very temple that uh, they are in, these two men are in. John chapter 2, verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there, making a whip of cords. He drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Well, it was a house of trade. It was a very good trade. First of all, you couldn't take your own money in there. You had to change your money into the temple money. And so there's a cream off going on right there. You couldn't take your own animal in there to sacrifice, which indeed was what the Levitical law had actually laid out, because it wouldn't be up to snuff, would it? It wouldn't know, well, there's a blemish here, there's a blemish there, it's not, but we have one here that's, of course, three times the price of the already inflated, skimmed off the top shekels, uh, the, the temple shekels. It's a swindling, it's extortion, and it's thievery. It's very easy to ignore what is going on and not believe that you are part of it. But this man, as a Pharisee, was either a tacit supporter or a substantial beneficiary from the very thievery that he is accusing this tax collector of. So now we get to unjust. Unjust. Let's go to um, uh, John chapter 8. Now, more familiar territory. John chapter 8. And uh, where uh, in verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. It's not my intention to go through this whole story. It's a, it's a wonderful story. My, I want to point out the fact that in the justice business, they are horribly lacking because where is the guy? Where is the man? This is not justice. This is not justice. If you look at the Levitical law, it demands that the man and the woman pay the penalty. So they don't know justice. John 11, verse 45 This is right after the Lord uh, raises Lazarus. And uh, 
Starting uh, in verse 45, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Well, is that a problem? Is, that, is this a breach of the law? And then they, they uh, commit uh, exaggeration. The Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. You don't know that. The Romans really weren't bothered one way or another by what the Lord was doing. You don't find him being held up by the Romans. As long as they get their tax money, they're fine. And that there isn't insurrection. No, what we're listening to is interest, not justice. It is not in their interest. They want to preserve their power. They want to preserve their situation. Don't call, don't call others unjust. You're unjust yourself. Adulterers. This was the last of his accusations. Well, of course, in Matthew chapter 5, and the uh, Sermon on the Mount, what does he say? It's chapter 5, verse 27. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Sad to say, it's really quite a small carter of individuals in the male gender who can be innocent of this. And we can reasonably assume that our Pharisee is not in that tiny minority. So his assertions about his own righteousness are worthless. Now he says, I fast, this is verse 12, I fast twice a week. Fasting. Well, we can look at Isaiah 58 and see what the Lord thinks about their fasting. Isaiah 58. And I wonder if he's read it. By the way, there's no reason to assume that twice a week was uh, anything but his own choice. Uh, There certainly isn't any indication in the Levitical law that this is a practice. Uh, This is Isaiah 58. Cry aloud, do not hold back. The Lord is talking to to the prophet. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if there were a nation that did righteousness. And did not forsake judgment, the judgments of their God. They ask me of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your, ple- your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? It is to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? It is not this the fast that I choose. To loose the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. 
And of course, the Lord talks about the yoke and how the Pharisees have placed a heavy burden on their people. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of your finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out of the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, Then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in the scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose water do not fail. And the ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of the streets to dwell in. I give tithes of all that I get, in verse 12 of chapter 18. I give tithes of all that I get. Tithing is good. Everyone should do it. But you do it out of gratitude and humility, thanksgiving. Not to make yourself feel righteous. Now we'll get to the other guy in verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, Be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, we know that the Lord, what the Lord can do with a tax collector, because he wrote one of the Gospels. And it's not that Matthew was a really deep down a respectable person just waiting to get out. He was a tax collector. But when the Lord came to him, he responded and followed the Lord and laid the rest of it all aside. This tax collector... has come to the end of himself. This tax collector is not puffed up like the Pharisee. Remember, as Paul writes to the Corinthians, he said, it's not to puff up, it's to build up. I do these things not to puff up, but to build up. And as we see also in Isaiah, that it was the building. But when you come to the end of yourself, if you're willing to look up, Jesus is there. Jesus is the only person you need to meet at that point. He's the only person who can put you back together again. You realize, if you realize what a horrible person you are, that there isn't one good thing about you, and then you realize that Jesus knows everything about you and still loves you stubbornly and wonderfully, 
It's his love that will carry you through that dark time. There's a movie about uh, abortion where a doctor who was part of the whole beginning of it in uh, this nation finally realizes, it's finally revealed to him that this is a person that he is killing. That's a man who has reached the end of himself. Only Jesus can help you. I feel terrible for these people who don't look upon him and experience his love and care. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I had a similar experience. And I can tell you that it was absolutely horrible to discover that I was the one at fault and that I was, I had all of my ideas about myself were shattered and I realized how awful a person I was and how I had been able to rationalize all of this stuff so effectively in such a terrifying fashion. Rationalization is terrifying. Our ability to do this, we can send people into gas chambers, we can shoot them, we can take their children from them, look at what they were doing to, look at what the they were doing to them just before the Maccabean revolt. They were, the, the, if, you, if you circumcised your, your, your children, they were burned in front of you. People do the most despicable things. And when you, you find out that you're, that's, the, that's the group you're in, we're all in it. Who can get you out of it? The Lord can. So that you don't destroy yourself well, he's come to the end of his self. He's come to a, a good place because now the Lord can rebuild him. Only the Lord Jesus can break a man and not destroy him because he can rebuild him. He can rebuild us. So the Lord says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And that exaltation will, of course, not be personal. It will be through Christ and exalting Christ in your life. So the last part of this is something that uh, I'd like to cover because it isn't in our schedule. And it's just this short thing here um, at verse 15 in chapter 18. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter into it. So Sandra and I were kicking this around, and she came up with an interesting hypothesis. So, all right. We're in this workaday world, we're in this material environment, we drive cars, we drive trucks, we fly planes, we uh, sit in nice chairs and some uncomfortable ones, and we experience everything on a, on a sensual basis, okay? 
and we have our ambitions and we have our pleasures and uh, we have our disappointments and everything. We're in this material world. And somebody says, uh, well, by the way, this is just a testing ground <laughs> because this was all created by somebody. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, they, we fell from grace and that's why there's so much trouble in the world and that's why your heart is troubled and that's why you won't recognize God. And he sent his son to die for our sins. Die? Yes, he has to die. He had to shed his blood. And the, the, the shed blood of Christ is what has washed you clean of your sins. If you will believe in believe in him, yeah, yes, if you will believe in him. Okay, well, this is, um, you know, I've, I've, got a, I've got a doctor's appointment in 20 minutes. So, you know, so here we go. Santa Claus. Santa Claus, okay? Better known in my uh, home uh, land as Father Christmas. A child has no problem with the notion that on a single day, this fat elf can come down every chimney in the world and deliver the gifts that are at the foot of the bed or around the tree or wherever you put it, they don't have a problem believing that uh, because they've been told it from a trusted source. Now I know it's a little edgy, but you get what we're talking about here. They're not crowded by disbelief, by, by disappointment, by frustration. By, they're not clouded by all of this, this noise that is going on in us as a consequence of having to struggle with, with our lives here. They're just ready to believe it. What's he say? Let the children come. To, for, to such belongs the kingdom of God. And in simplicity, they get it. So I have to get a book. Now, I am uh, I'm unabashedly a Narnia fan. Uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. And I will... I will bore anyone to tears on the subject if they want to. Uh, but, um, and this is going to take a few moments because I have to set the scene for you. If you've read the, the Chronicles, then you'll know where we are, but it's in this one called the Silver Chair. And the Crown Prince of Narnia has been kidnapped by a witch who has taken him to her slave kingdom, which is underground in darkness, dank and horrible. And she is an enchantress. And so she has enchanted him. And uh, Aslan, who is the Christ figure in uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, has sent uh, a motley crew to rescue him. Two children and uh, a character called a Marshwiggle, who is a Narnian uh, resident, whereas the children are from the world. And this Marsh Wiggle is a, is a humanoid uh, figure with some modifications to help him live in the wetlands, okay? But he is uh, a reasoning person, and he is a terrible pessimist. Uh, he thinks everything's going to go wrong, uh, yet he has a good heart. They have found a way to break the enchantment on the prince, uh, and uh, they are now uh, seeking to escape uh, to Overland, which is the land above all of this that, they, that uh, is Narnia. And the queen, uh, the witch has uh, captured them, the queen of this there, and uh, found, uh, stopped them escaping and ha is beginning to enchant them again and tell them that this Overland is a figment of their imagination. And they're beginning to believe it. They're beginning to get sucked into it because she's so powerful. When uh, the Marsh Wiggle, I can't remember if he accidentally, but he burns himself and is suddenly brought up short. And he makes this, uh, he makes this uh, wonderful statement. And uh, he says, One word, ma'am, 
he is talking to the queen, the, the, the witch. He said, coming back from the fire, he said, coming back from the fire, limping because of the pain. One word. All you've been saying is quite right. I shouldn't wonder. In other words, she's been telling him that it doesn't exist. I'm a chap who always liked to know the worst and then put the best face I can on it. So I won't deny any of what you have said. But there's one thing more to be said, even so. Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things, trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. Then all I can say is that in that case, the made-up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. And that's a funny thing when you come to think of it. We're just babies making up a game, if you're right. But four babies playing a game can make a play world which licks your real world. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. So thankfully, you kindly for, we thanking you kindly for supper. If these two gentlemen and young lady are ready, we're leaving your court at once and setting out into the dark to spend our lives looking for the overland. Not that our lives will be very long, I should think, but that's small loss if the world's as dull a place as you say. Not, um, not, not ecclesiastically locked up or anything like that. It's just a sort of side look at uh, the way we've, we view things and when when the enchantments come into our mind, you know, when those, when, when, when we're being to persuaded to doubt and to, to worry, no, we're built for, we've been made for this better life in Christ. We've been made for it. And I can't touch it and I can't show it to you, and, but, but I know it's real. And I don't care what you say to me in your rotten little world that you have where no one gets justified and, and there's no justice and there's no, there's, there's no kindness. In this rotten little world, you can't tell me. I'm not made for that. I'm made for the kingdom of Christ. Thank you.